We've seen a bunch of true freshmen become standout players for the Irish in recent years. So which young guys have the best chance to break out this year? My top five list of the most impactful freshmen in 2024 next. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up? Welcome to Locked On Irish, your daily Notre Dame podcast. And today is Wednesday, June 19th. And thank you for starting your day by joining me here and making this your first listen of the day. My name is Tyler Rojak, and I'm the host of this program. I graduated from Notre Dame in 2018, and now I'm a producer at Fox Sports. Really appreciate you tuning in today, however that may be. If you are watching along on YouTube, please remember to give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Or if you're a podcast listener, please take a quick second to rate the show five stars, leave a review, and subscribe there as well. Folks, now that the NBA Finals is over, the Stanley Cup is almost over, hell, even the Men's College Baseball World Series is almost over, it is officially list season in the sports content world. Some people might refer to it as Mount Rushmore season, whatever floats your boat. It is that time of the year in the sports calendar when, frankly, there isn't a whole lot going on. But you know what is great content that is sure to get people riled up pretty much every single time? Lists. But people do them because they work. They're fun to debate, argue, really whatever you want to do with them. And last week I actually did two lists. So I guess you could say that list season started a little bit early. Uh, Last week I did my top five breakout candidates on both sides of the ball. And today I'm going to do a similar exercise, but I'm going to focus on the freshman class by revealing who I believe will be the top five most impactful freshmen this fall. And to be clear, this is just for the season. I'm not predicting who will be the top five players in this class, and redshirt freshmen are not included either. This is about the guys who are currently freshmen, both academically and eligibility-wise, and I think that they're going to see the field a lot this year and could ball out. We know that Mark Freeman is a tireless worker on the recruiting trail, and that has led to more uh, talented prospects coming on this roster, and a lot of those guys have been able to make an impact in their first year on the squad. Just look at last year. You've got Jane Greathouse, Enrico Flores, at wide receiver. The year before, Benjamin Morrison surprised everyone when he became a starting corner very early on in the season and had one of the best freshman seasons of any Notre Dame defensive back in program history. So we've seen it a lot. Now we're going to try to predict who that is going to be this season. And we're going to go through this one through five because I don't think there's like a big reveal for number one like I did with the breakout candidates. If you've been listening to the show for a while, you know who my number one is going to be. It is linebacker Kingston Viliamu Asa. And frankly... The more I talk about KVA, the more I feel like I'm becoming a little bit repetitive. Like, this guy hasn't even played a single game yet for the Irish, but I am just so confident that he's going to be a great player for this year's team, and he will be a great player throughout the rest of his college career, and I think he has a great chance to be an NFL player as well, which is crazy to say about a guy who, again, has not taken one real snap for Notre Dame, but I just think that highly of him. Um, The recruiting rankings agree with me. He's ranked just outside the top 50, uh, one of the top linebackers in the class of 2024, Ohio State really wanted him. USC really wanted him. A bunch of other schools around the country really wanted KVA services, but he ended up at Notre Dame. So a great win on the recruiting trail for the Irish, and I think that's going to pay immediate dividends this season. It was clear to everyone who watched him play in high school that KVA was ready to go, and Marcus Freeman basically eliminated any doubt of his hesitancy to play a freshman linebacker on signing day when he said, quote, every once in a while you see a freshman and say he's going to have a chance early. And Marcus Freeman was saying that about KVA. And then he would go on to say that Kingston Villamu Asa is the most college ready prospect in Notre Dame's most recent recruiting class. Quote, he will have a chance to compete right away, I'm sure. End quote. So, again, this isn't necessarily news to you if you've been listening to the show every day, but I think a fun way to look at this would be how big of an impact could KVA have compared to other historically great Notre Dame linebackers? We're going to focus on the recent history here, go through some of the best linebackers to come through Notre Dame over the past couple decades and try to compare and contrast their freshman seasons to what I think KVA is going to do this year. So let's go to the most recent one. Jeremiah Uwusu Kormoa, not a ton to report there. He redshirted his freshman season, played in just two games his sophomore year as well before he got hurt, and then really broke out onto the scene in 2019. So he's going to have a better year than JOK, uh, you know, so long as he stays healthy. Then you got Jalen Smith. We're going to go back a little bit. Uh, Jalen Smith started all 13 games 
at outside linebacker during his freshman season. And that probably would not have happened, or at least not all 13 games, if Danny Spond, who was the veteran outside linebacker, um, who was actually higher on the depth chart than Jalen Smith, at least at the start of the year, Spawn suffered a season-ending injury, and I think it was a career-ending injury, um, something head-neck-related. But anyway, Spond was going to be the day-one starter, then he got hurt, and then Jalen Smith was thrust into the starting role at the very start of his freshman season. That season, Jalen Smith registered 67 total tackles, which was third on the team and now the third most ever by an Irish freshman in school history. He also had six and a half tackles for loss, which was second on the team that year. He had a forced fumble, a fumble recovery, and one of the plays of the year, his first career interception against USC in a pivotal moment, which was one of the most exciting plays of that season. And one of those plays where you're like, oh my God, that guy is a true freshman. Seriously, and he's making that kind of a play at this moment in a rivalry game. Like, he just did stuff that you can't teach, and he was doing it as a true freshman. So it was a sign of things to come, obviously, because Jalen Smith went on to have an excellent career at Notre Dame. Another linebacker who is a little bit more recent than Jalen Smith, Tavon Coney. Not quite to the level that Jalen Smith was or Manti Teo was, but still a really good linebacker when he was at Notre Dame. He played in all 12 games during his freshman season. Most of that was on special teams. He did end up with six tackles on the year. So he ended up having a great career, not necessarily a great freshman season. And then that brings us to Manti Teo. One of the greatest linebackers in school history, Manti appeared in all 12 games of his freshman season and became the full-time starter by the fifth game of that year. He registered 57 tackles over the last eight games once he took over the starting job. So once he was put into that starting spot, he was not going to give it up. He took it and he ran with it and he never gave it back. He finished the season with 63 total tackles, which is fourth on the team. And at the time, it was the third most by a freshman in school history until Jalen Smith uh, beat him out in his freshman season. Now it is the fourth most, which is still really, really impressive. He also had five and a half tackles for loss, a sack, a pass breakup, and he finished the season with 10 tackles in a game against Stanford. And that's back uh, during the days when Stanford was really good and Manti Tao was one of the best players on the field as a true freshman. So a really standout freshman year, standout career. So how is KVA going to compare to these guys? Frankly, I don't think that Kingston is going to put up the same kind of numbers because he is probably going to be splitting time with Drake Bowen, who, you know, you look back at the recruiting class the year before, he was like the leader of that class. He wasn't quite uh, ranked as high as KVA, but he was still a high four-star linebacker from the state of Indiana, was probably Notre Dame's biggest recruiter in the class. He was leading the charge. Once he was on campus with the other commits and other uncommitted prospects, he was always putting on for Notre Dame. And I think that the fan base really has an attachment to Drake Bowen for that reason. But then KVA came in and they were like, oh, this guy's a little bit different. But I'm still very high on Drake Bowen. I think he's going to have a great career. And I think that he's actually going to be the starter in the first game of the season. Now, there's a real chance that KVA could eventually take over the starting job. But Bowen is too solid a player to just completely relinquish all the snaps there at the Mike linebacker position. I think they're going to split time. It's going to be really interesting to see what Notre Dame does in the bigger games, especially late in the season, like, say, Florida State. Like, how is Al Golden and Max Bola going to uh, divvy those reps out between Bowen and KVA? Are they going to trust one more than the other? Because if it's a matter of trust, they might actually trust Bowen a little bit more because he's been in the system for one year longer than KVA has. It's going to be really interesting to see how it plays out because KVA has a little bit more natural athleticism and can do some things that Drake Bowen just frankly can't do because of his God-given ability. But if I had to guess, I think KVA is going to have a far more productive season than Tavon Coney and Jeremiah Usu koromoa did in their freshman years, but I don't think he's going to be quite as productive as Jalen Smith and Manti Teo because I don't think he's going to have the amount of snaps and the opportunity that those guys did. But the fact that KVA is already being put in that sort of company is incredibly exciting, and that is a very, very good place to be for the true freshman out of California. All right, coming up, could another freshman wide receiver be as productive as Jane Greathouse and Rico Flores were in 2023? That's next. This episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors is everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not 
cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebay.com slash motors. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers, eligible items only, exclusions apply. All right, coming in at number two on my top five list of, of the most impactful freshmen in 2024, I think it's going to be wide receiver Micah Gilbert. Gilbert was one of the stars of spring practice for Notre Dame, and then he ended up capping that off with two touchdowns in the spring game. There was a lot of talk about Gilbert throughout spring practice, and the Notre Dame social media team actually highlighted him during or maybe after one of the practice sessions. They put out a highlight reel of Micah Gilbert making plays in spring practice. And as I mentioned a couple of episodes ago, with Christian Gray, I think that matters a lot. Notre Dame also posted a video of Christian Gray making a bunch of plays in spring practice. Now, it's a little bit different for Christian Gray because he's already been around the program for a year. But still, I think it means a lot because think about it this way, right? Like, imagine you're a veteran on the team and you've been around the program for a while. You've paid your dues, all that stuff. And you're going out there and you're busting your ass every day in practice and you feel like you're doing a good job. And then all of a sudden, the Notre Dame social media team puts out a video of a freshman who, frankly, in your mind, hasn't really been doing that much, hasn't really been productive. How would that make you feel? You'd probably be pretty upset about that, right? You're like, wait, why are they highlighting this dude? This dude's not even that good. Yeah, I made a couple plays, but I'm the one who's out there grinding. I've been around here for a while. Why aren't they shining light on me? That could happen if Gilbert wasn't actually making plays all the time in spring practice. And from everything I've heard, Gilbert was doing just that. He was extremely productive from day one of spring practice, which is why I think that the Notre Dame social media team went out and posted that. They're not going to do that if the player is not really contributing and not being a real playmaker every single day, because I think that just sends the wrong message to some of the other guys in the team. Yes, it's just a quick 60-second video on social media, but I'm telling you, that stuff matters, especially to the guys in that locker room. And also, of course, the player who gets spotlighted there because then that helps build their confidence, and I think that did happen right here with Micah Gilbert. Now, if you look back at the recruiting rankings, Cam Williams was actually the higher-rated wide receiver prospect coming out of high school. When he was uh, when he committed to Notre Dame, he was like borderline five-star. I think some recruiting services actually had Cam Williams as a five-star, and I'm still incredibly high on what he can do at the college level because I think Cam Williams just has some athletic traits that are God-given and there's things that you can't teach. But from the standpoint of being a true wide receiver at the college level, I think Cam Williams has a little bit more a little bit more work to do than Micah Gilbert because even during high school when Cam Williams is the higher ranked guy and he was absolutely lighting it up in high school, he was scoring basically every time he touched the ball. You started to hear whispers that the coaching staff looked at Micah Gilbert as the more physically ready, college ready prospect out of the two of them. And I think that's why he was such a big contributor in spring practice and specifically in that spring game. A big part of that is his size. Gilbert is six foot three, 203 pounds, and he's just got It looks like he's a little bit more physically mature than Cam Williams and also has a better understanding of the fundamentals and technique that you need to have in order to play wide receiver at the college level. Like you can have, you know, great speed, great quickness, but if you can't get off press coverage, you're not going to play in college football. And I think that's why Gilbert has a leg up on Cam Williams today. Cam Williams could certainly end up being the better receiver out of the two, but right now it's Gilbert. Gilbert put up 1,200 receiving yards and 10 touchdowns in his senior year at Charlotte Christian. Even though those aren't like the eye-popping numbers that Cam Williams did, still very impressive. And I think when you look at what Gilbert is doing or what Gilbert is going to do this year and you compare it, to what Notre Dame had last year, and their true freshman wide receivers, it's a very dis- different situation. Because I don't think you're going to find many true freshman wide receivers who were more college-ready than Jane Greathouse. I mean, physically, he kind of looked like a tight end as a true freshman, which is insane. Not necessarily in his height, but in his thickness. That stood out from the moment that I saw Jane Greathouse in spring practice, and that's a big reason why I played early. Also, Jane Greathouse played at like a small college program at his high school, uh, Austin Westlake, down there in Texas. So it was very clear that Jane Greathouse was going to be a contributor right away. Rico Flores took some people by surprise because physically he wasn't as mature as Jane Greathouse, but he was just a dog. And there were some points last season when he was Notre Dame's number one wide receiver option. Now, Rico Flores has transferred to UCLA, which is really unfortunate. And I wonder if he regrets that now. And even though I live literally like one mile away from UCLA's campus, I love the area. I love Westwood. I love all that. Still, I'd much rather be playing um, for Mike Denbrock and his offense at Notre Dame than whatever UCLA's got going now after Chip Kelly left. But still, let's get back to Gilbert. Unfortunately for Gilbert, 
the receiver room is in a much better place than it was last year for Jane Greathouse and Rico Flores. Notre Dame added veterans in the transfer portal like Bo Collins, Chris Mitchell, and Jane Harrison. And even though they aren't guaranteed to start, they are going to get some reps. Mike Brown, Notre Dame's new wide receivers coach, said he wants a six-man rotation at wide receiver. To be honest, I think that's too few. I think that Notre Dame should be rotating eight guys or have roles for eight different guys. Maybe he expands on that as the year goes on, um, but he wants to have six. So who is going to make that top six? We know Jane Thomas, Jane Greathouse, and Jordan Faison are going to be in there. They're the returning guys. I just mentioned Chris Mitchell, Jane Harrison, Bo Collins. They're going to have a role. So where does that leave Gilbert? I think he's going to have to beat out a couple of those guys, and I think he will at some point this season. He's versatile. He can play on the boundary. He can play in the field, and I think that makes him more likely to play. I don't really see him getting reps at the slot just because Notre Dame already has Thomas, Greathouse, Faison, and other guys who can rotate in there as well, like Jane Harrison. So he still has two wide receiver positions that he can play. He showed He's shown that he can play them effectively in spring practice, and I think he's physically ready, and he's going to be a playmaker when he's out there. He is going to be a factor this season. Okay, number three, I've got Bryce Young, another early enrollee freshman who stood out in spring practice. Young has absolute freakish size. He's six foot seven, 246 pounds, and frankly, Notre Dame does not get that many guys who look like Bryce Young. He looks like a basketball player who's also big enough to play football, and that is what those guys look like in the SEC, and now Notre Dame finally has one on the edge. I really have not seen a rise of the recruiting rankings like Bryce Young's. I mean, he was outside the top 300 players nationally when he committed to Notre Dame, and then he ended up close to the top 50. I think depending on which recruiting site you looked at, he was cracking five-star status, which was insane. He was that good his senior year. And really, I do think the fact that the fact that he's a son of a Notre Dame legend and Hall of Famer, Bryant Young, certainly helps his cause, but still, he earned that on his own by being such a good player and having just freakish tools and physical traits that most guys just don't have at any level, let alone the high school level. So, I have no doubt that Bryce Young is going to end up being a great defensive end for Notre Dame, but what impact is he going to have this year? It's a little bit hard to say because Notre Dame has an extremely veteran unit on the defensive line. Right now, it looks like that Bryce Young is going to play the field end this season and probably for the rest of his career unless they want to move him to Viper. I think he's more of a field end. So he's going to back up the sixth-year Duke transfer, R.J. Oban, and junior Josh Burnham at least to start the year. We know that R.J. Oban can get after the passer, so he's going to be in there in passing situations. Josh Burnham might be a little bit better than um, Oban in terms of stopping the run, but still, I think that there's going to be a role for Bryce Young on this team. It's difficult to say what that's going to be right now. Again, he's only had, what, 15 practices under his belt. He still has plenty of work to do in the weight room, but he just makes some plays in the field. Like, Let's think back to that uh, spring game, right? Bryce Young forced a fumble in that game on Jabron Payne. The unfortunate part about that play was Jabron Payne limped off the field, and even though I'm not 100% certain, I think that's the play that Jabron Payne suffered his season-ending ACL tear. That news came out a couple weeks ago. We talked about it on the show, and we knew that it happened in the spring game, but still, he didn't like get carted off the field or anything, but when you look back at that play, the way that Payne came off the field, you're like, oh yeah, he's hurt. It kind of looked like it might be upper body, but let's focus on what Bryce Young did on that play. He basically just stuck his arm out, just stopped Jabron Payne dead in his tracks. And Payne, even though he's not a big guy, he's a really hard runner. And then Bryce Young just whipped him down, forced a fumble on the play. His team recovered the ball, and it was a huge play for the true freshman to make. And it was one of those plays where you're like, whoa, who made that play? Oh, yeah, it was Bryce Young, the freshman. And even though he doesn't have as much experience as the guys in front of him, and even though he probably has a long way to go in terms of his technique and his fundamentals, he's just so freaky, and, uh, so freaky, excuse me, and I think he brings some things to the table that are going to force his way, or they're, that are they going to help him force his way onto the field this season. I understand it's a crowded room, but he has the tools that those other guys don't have, and I think for that reason, he's going to make some plays this year. I think... Probably going to average around like single digit snaps a game. But still, when you consider all the older guys in that room, the fact that he's even getting that amount of playing time as a true freshman would be really, really impressive. All right, coming up in segment three, we know running backs coach Dylan McCullough is not afraid to play freshman running backs. But could either Keedron Young or Aeneas Williams do enough to take carries away from Jadarian Price and Jeremiah Love next year? Find out right after this. Okay, coming in at number four on my list, the top five most impactful freshmen in 2024, I think it's going to be running back Keegan Young. I felt like I had to pick a running back, right? 
These two guys are extremely talented, and I went back and forth between Kedron Young and Aeneas Williams for this fourth spot, but I'm going to go with Young for a couple of reasons. I understand that Aeneas Williams did have a better spring practice. Both of them were early enrollees, but then Kedron Young ended up getting hurt, and Aeneas Williams ended up having a really strong session. He actually scored in the spring game, and I think that matters. But when I look at them, at the two of them, and I compare and contrast, I think Young is a little bit more physically ready to go. Like he's already drawing comparisons to Audrey Estime in terms of like his stature. Now there are going to be very few running backs to ever come through this program or really ever come through college football that are as big as Audrey Estime was in his freshman season. Like I remember that picture that went viral of Audrey Estime in the sand trap just looked like the Hulk out there. And you're like, Oh yeah, this guy is going to end up being a really good running back for Notre Dame. And he was young. Isn't quite, that level of like freakishly jacked, but still he does not look like a true freshman. That's a big reason why he was the higher ranked prospect coming out of high school. Young was actually the number 10th ranked running back in the class, according to the 24 seven sports composite, whereas Williams was number 19. If you watch Keegan Young's high school tape in Lufkin, Texas, it was like genuinely funny how much he dominated. And I know that a lot of these guys, a lot of these top high end prospects when you watch their high school tape, Most of the time, they're just running circles around the dudes on the field. But there was something different about Young because he was so big and he was so strong. He he didn't really have to, like, juke or make a whole bunch of moves. He would just go north and south, right down the field for a score. And he was going up against good competition, too. And it just looked like a man amongst boys out there. And even though it's obviously not going to be like that once he gets to college, I think his running style and the way that he's physically built is going to allow him to get onto the field as a true freshman. Again, I think both these guys could end up having great college careers. I just think Keedron Young has a chance to carve out a role as a freshman. We've t- heard about Dylan McCullough's philosophy before, right? There are a list of qualities, a list of things that he asks of his entire running back room and basically assigns the players in his room to those roles based on their skill set. For example, last year, Jabron Payne was the short yardage back, even though Notre Dame had Audrey Kesame. Audrey Kesame was, as I mentioned, one of the most physically large specimens that have, that Notre Dame has ever seen. And yet Notre Dame would roll out Jabron Payne on like third and short situations, even though Jabron Payne was like 5'9". Now, I'm not necessarily criticizing it, even though I didn't always understand it, because Jabron Payne was good in those situations. He converted on a lot of third and shorts, scored a couple of touchdowns in the, um, in the red zone. So he was effective in that role. But the fact that Dylan McCullough was willing to give up that role to Jabron Payne makes me think that he's open to giving a true freshman that role as well. And that is exactly why I think Keedron Young is going to have an impact this season because Jabron Payne is out for the season with that torn ACL injury that I mentioned in the previous segment. That role is up for grabs. Now, the easy answer might be just give Jadarian Price the ball. He's big. He's really talented back. He's going to get that first down. Could easily be him. And I'm sure that there are going to be some situations this year when Jadarian Price is given the ball in a third and short or fourth and short or something like that. But I also think that Keidre Young has the physical stature and the running style to do the same thing. There's another guy who could do that. That's Riley Leonard. But he is the quarterback. So even though Notre Dame is definitely going to utilize him in, in third and short, fourth and short, those kind of situations, you don't want to put too much pressure on the quarterback. You don't want him taking too many hits. And also, you don't want your top two backs taking hits as well. So I think Keedron Young is going to have a real shot at assuming that role for the Notre Dame running back room. And I think he is going to um, have a real serious role on this team. Again, he's got extremely long leg, extremely strong legs, and that is what you need to thrive in short yarded situations. He's the type of downhill back that could be really effective here. And I think there's a good chance that Nias Williams' role too but Price, Love, and Riley Leonard are going to take up the vast majority of the carries on this team. So all the other carries that are left for the rest of the group, they're going to be hard to come by unless it's specific situations, and I just think Keedron Young is perfect for a specific situation. All right, who do I have at number five? This one was really tough. Um, You'll notice that I don't have C.J. Carr in here. I haven't mentioned him one time. Look, I think C.J. Carr is a really bright future, but... I hope he doesn't play this season because Notre Dame has Riley Leonard and I want him to start every game and play the whole year healthy. And if for whatever reason, Riley Leonard gets hurt or he's not able to play, then Steve Angeli, he's been around a lot longer. Those guys are going to take up way more of the snaps, way more of the opportunities than CJ Carr next year. Different story, but he is not number five on this list because we're focused on 2024 and number five, I've got cornerbacks 
Leonard Moore slash Carson Hobbs. This was tough. I couldn't pick one because, frankly, neither of them uh, were a part of string practice, so they're just now getting on campus for summer workouts, and then they're going to be uh, there in fall camp. That's going to be their real first impression on the practice field. So I just included them both. I, I'll admit, kind of a cop-out. I probably should have just picked one, but I'm including them both here. But let's be honest. If all goes to plan, Leonard Moore and Carson Hobbs, neither neither one of them is going to be playing much this season outside of special teams. Notre Dame already has Benjamin Morrison, one of, if not the best, cornerbacks in the entire country. They also have Christian Gray, Jane Mickey. They have Jordan Clark at nickel. Chance Tucker is a good veteran backup who can come in in case of emergency. But the problem is it stops there. Notre Dame lost Micah Bell to the transfer portal. They lost Clarence Lewis to the transfer portal as well. And if Clarence Lewis had stayed, he definitely would have had a role on this team as the third, or he would have been the fourth cornerback um, backup nickel. He would have been like the first guy off the bench, maybe after Jane Mickey. But still, Notre Dame really wanted him, and that was a big loss in terms of the depth in the cornerback room, even though we all, none of us really expected Clarence Lewis to start for the Irish this season. Also, we know that the staff did try to go out and get a defensive back in the transfer portal this most recent cycle, but it didn't happen. So they recognize that depth is a bit of a concern here, which might allow Moore or Hobbs to get some playing time this season. Also have to take into the fact that Benjamin Morrison is hurt. Jordan Clark has an injury history. So there is a chance that at some point this season, Notre Dame is going to be without there's top cornerback or maybe a couple of their top guys, and they're going to have to dig deep into that depth chart. If that happens, Moore and or Hobbs might be thrust into the action. Last year, Christian Gray played as a true freshman, despite the fact that Notre Dame had Benjamin Morris and Cam Hart. I think that was a different situation because Christian Gray earned that playing time by being so talented as a true freshman. I don't think Moore or Hobbs are that good right away. I could be proven wrong. I mean, Hell, I don't think anyone expected Benjamin Morrison to be as effective uh, as he was his freshman season, and he wasn't an early enrollee either. He wasn't ranked in in the top 300 either. So it's not impossible for one of these guys to just come out of the scene and surprise us all, but frankly, I'm not that high on them, and neither of these guys were early enrollees like I mentioned, so I think they're going to have to just make a really strong impression this summer and in fall camp to have a real shot at this. I'm not necessarily hoping for one of these guys to be forced to make an impact, but I'm not counting it out either. I definitely could uh, could see one of these guys end up playing a good amount and have a big impact on this Notre Dame defense this year. But again, let's just hope that all the guys are healthy, and if Moore or Hobbs do end up making an impact, it's because they earned it, a lot like Christian Gray and Benjamin Morrison did, and did as opposed to just being thrust in because of injuries. Okay, so let's go back through the top five. Number one, I've got Kingsley Bilyamuasa, the linebacker. Two, wide receiver Mike Gilbert. Three, Bryce Young. Four, Keedron Young. And five, cornerbacks Leonard Moore or Carson Hobbs. That's my top five. You let me know what your top five is. You can drop them below in the comments. You can send them over to me on social media. The X count is at Locked On Irish. Instagram is at Locked On Irish Pod. But that is going to do it for me today. Thanks again for making Locked On Irish first listen of the day. Tomorrow, recruiting analyst Eric Thomas will return to the show to recap all the major events and storylines from this past month on the recruiting trail. Eric actually came on a couple weeks ago for the first time since he joined the team at Irish Illustrated, and I thought he was great. I heard a ton of great feedback, so um, you're not going to want to miss out on that episode coming out tomorrow. Also, be sure to subscribe on YouTube or wherever you're listening to the podcast, and I'll see you tomorrow. Same time, same place.